Today is part two of our series on the Mass. So if you haven't heard part one, I encourage you to go to our website and listen to part one. And last week we talked a little bit about sacred vessels and vestments. Today we're going to talk about sacred music. So we're going to kind of continue the, the con concept of sacred things, things that are set apart for God. But before we do that, um, we just got to stop and take a moment and think. Uh, the Mass is meant to do something to us. It's meant to form our hearts and our minds to expect heaven, to get ready to go to heaven. It should look different than the world. That's why we dress differently. I don't wear this to birthday parties. Right? I, I don't wear this out in the street. I wear it here when I'm celebrating Mass. The servers don't dress like that out in the world. They dress like that when they're assisting at sacred ministry and worship, right? And all of the vestments, the vessels, these other things, we don't use them for a barbecue or a picnic potluck. No, these are sacred vessels that are only used for the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, right? They've been consecrated for that purpose. And so our music needs to be the same. Our music for the Mass needs to be what they call sacred. And we talk about the difference between sacred and profane. Profane doesn't mean like profanity like you swear, but profane just means it's something in the world, secular, something in the world, whereas sacred is something set apart for God. And so when you come to Mass, it should shock you a little bit. You should be like, oh, this is different. <laughs> this is not like going to Burger King. <laughs> this is not like going to the bar. This is not like going to a dance. This is the Mass, and there's something different about it, and it forms my sensitivities the more that I'm around it. Now, I want to just share a little bit with you. When I grew up, I grew up in a house that did not listen to any secular music, okay? It was a little bit odd, but uh, that was my parents' decision. That They both grew up in the 60s, and, and they had experienced things, and they decided, you know what, in our house, we're just going to listen to religious music. So I, I listened to instrumental jazz. That was the most uh, rebellious thing that I did, right? But there was no words to it, right? So everything else I listened to was contemporary praise music in the home. So my whole mentality was formed by the idea that music is for the praise of God. So when I went to high school, I was very shocked when I heard some of the things people were listening to. And I cried. I wept because for the first time I heard something truly ugly. And I learned what the world is listening to and why the world is so messed up. Because if you change your music, friends, you're going to change a lot of your thoughts, aren't you? Because why do you think our world is so perverted? Why is our world so angry? Why is our world so disgusting? It's because a lot of the music that we listen to is horrendous. It's not beautiful. It's horrible, and it talks about horrible things. It glorifies sin and violence and profanity. And we have to say, if our culture is profane, it is because our art is profane. If we want to change the culture, you've got to start with ourselves and say, I will only listen to good art. Because I want my sensitivity to be formed by higher things, and I don't want to lower myself. And so if that's true just in your regular life, how much more for the Mass? How much more for the Mass? So that needs to be the first thing, to say, there's nothing too beautiful for God. And when we understand what's happening here at Mass, it forms our understanding of what we should do. Because so often what we do is we try to put a meaning on the Mass. And the fact is the Mass has a meaning. We need to discover it. It's part of the deposit of faith that's been handed down to us. So sacred music is designed for the worship of God and not worldly acceptance or praise. Uh, there's great CDs for Gregorian chant, but you don't usually get them. You now it's interesting. A lot of times, like the sisters, there's, there's a group of Benedictine nuns out in the Midwest. Their CD for Gregorian chant was on the top of the charts. You wonder why? Because there's nothing else beautiful around. <laughs> and people are hungering for the sacred. They recognize the world has gone mad. And these women, these beautiful women who've given their lives to Jesus, their prayer and what's reflected in their contemplation comes out in their music. And they're just desperate for it. The world is hungry for the gospel, friends. And when we recover what is truly ours, the world will recognize that Jesus is alive. The whole purpose of sacred music is not to make a concert. It is to glorify God because some of the most beautiful art, whether it's paintings or music or everything else, has come from a reflection on what Jesus has done for us. Because it's so tremendous, it's so outrageous that we sinful people who rejected him over and over again for millennia, he came and he saved us because he loved us. And you're like, why? There's no reason except that God is love because we didn't have anything on ourselves or things that we did to please him. In fact, we were displeasing to him. We did horrible things to him and uh, to our neighbor. And the fact is God, in the midst of our sinfulness, came down and redeemed us from it. 
and endured horrible things. And so that's why we said some of the greatest art, because that tension between light and darkness, that tension between what we deserve and what we received is so outrageous that how can we not rejoice? Only if we don't meditate on what's going on. So the gospel today, uh, continuation of John 6, and this helps us understand a little bit what's going on. You remember last weekend we had the feeding of the 5,000, right? That was a miracle of which prophet in the Old Testament? What was the reminder of that? Remember? Which prophet? Oh my goodness, people. Do we not remember? Which prophet in the Old Testament multiplied loaves and fed people? Elisha. Okay, Elisha. It was a miracle of multiplication, and he multiplied, a few, he multiplied 20 loaves and he fed 100 people. All right? Okay, great. And there was some left over. Jesus, however, he takes five loaves, so a quarter of the resources, and feeds 5,000 people, which is 50 times the amount of people, right? So they're saying this is the new and the greater Elijah, the new and greater Elisha, right? But it's not enough for them because the Jews were expecting not just the coming again of Elijah, but they were expecting a prophet like me, like Moses, to come back. And so now they're saying, okay, that was cool, the Elisha thing. Can you do the Moses thing now? Can you bring down bread from heaven? Because that's what Moses did. And Jesus says, oh, guys, you got it all wrong. Moses didn't do that. Do you think Moses could open heaven and bring down bread for you? That was God who fed the people. And they're saying, okay, okay, fine. Give us that bread. And Jesus is like, I know you guys. You're not here because you saw signs. You're here because you got a free meal and you want one again. <laughs> do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life. Right? Because, and we have to realize this in the church because very often we come to Mass to be entertained. You know what the most popular thing that people say in surveys, the reason why they come to Mass, why they come to particular churches, because of the preaching and the music. Those two things. They want to be fed, they want to be entertained. And the fact is, is that, friends, no matter if the preaching stinks, no matter if the music is horrible, and thank God we have good music, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that even if it was horrible, you still have Jesus. Work for food that endures and not for the external trappings. You know, there's places that have better preaching. There's places that have full-on ensembles and choirs, and they pay tons of money for these things. And by the way, we need to pay our musicians because it's unjust. So I hope one day you will, you will uh, believe that enough with me to support that we can hire a full-time choir director who's fully trained in this so that we can do this, right? As, be that as it may, where was I? Oh, yes. Okay, Alicia. Moses. Okay, so, sorry. We had a leak in the, in the ceiling yesterday, so I was here until very late. Okay, so we're, we're okay now, I hope. Okay. <clears throat> Moses, right? He says, Moses didn't do that. That was my father. And say, okay, give us this bread. And Jesus says, I'm the bread. So he's saying, I'm not Moses. Remember the man in the desert? That was me. I was the bread that fed them. Yikes. Are you kidding? That's why we're going to see in the next weekend their shock and their response. But when we realize that, we realize that Jesus is saying, I'm not the new Moses. I'm not the new Elisha. I am the manna that fed them. And by the way, you remember there were two miracles that Moses happened around him. One was the bread that came down from heaven, but the other, what that we often forget, was there were so many quail that fell every day that it fed thousands and thousands of people. They must have decimated the population of quail in the Near East. The fact is that every day quail rained down in the evening and manna rained down in the morning. And Jesus is saying, guess what? I am the bread that came down from heaven. And guess what? The bread that I will give is my flesh. So now it's not just there was bread and quail. Now both the flesh and the bread are one in me. I'm both. I was their food. Ta-da. Boy, that's a shocking thing. This guy is not just a religious teacher. He's either nuts or he is the living God. There is no other option available to us because if you tell people, I'm bread that came down from heaven, and by the way, I pre-existed, I was a pre-existing bread that came down from heaven, you're nuts or else you're right. There aren't really, there isn't any, there's no latitude in there because normal people do not say such things. So those people that come and tell you Jesus is just a nice religious teacher, he is not. He is either nuts or he is the word of God made flesh. And that requires a completely different response. It requires that either you spend your whole life trying to destroy the Christian faith to get rid of it because it's the worst lie perpetuated on humanity or else it's the greatest news that has ever been or ever will be. Because our God came down to visit us. And not only one time, but he does it every single mass. Are you starting to get why things need to look different here? Because a few feet away from me is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread your fathers ate in the desert where they died, but anyone who eats this bread will live forever. That requires a complete change of our lives. You can't be indifferent about this. 
That's why I understand Satan is to try to steal the Eucharist and desecrate it. I understand it because they know what's going on here more than some Catholics who just come up with one hand and be like, ah, are you kidding me? You dare to touch the living God like that? Wake up! Wake up! Everything we do reveals what we believe and it starts to form our idea. And you know why so many people don't believe in the real presence? It's because for years we haven't knelt before the Lord. Parents, grandparents, I know you don't have to, but that's why we put back the altar rails, was to teach our children and the next generation who it is who's right here. Because if you come up and receive him like you're coming up to the checkout line in Walmart, guess what? Your kids are going to believe that it's just a piece of bread. Where else do you kneel down in your life? Where else do we bow? And so with sacred music too, where else do we hear this kind of music? So what is sacred music? So I want to I just uh, talk about this really quickly. Um, sacred music is not just music with words about Jesus. That's a misunderstanding. A lot, there's a lot of good Christian music out there, but it's not necessarily what the church calls sacred music. Sacred music has three qualities. The text, the beauty, and the universality. This is what our Archbishop talked about in his pastoral letter on music. So the text, the beauty, and the universality. So it's not just words about Jesus set to whatever music we want. It's a particular kind of music that is universal. How many of you have been to uh, Asia? Okay, a few people. Okay, how many have been to South America? Okay, a few people. All right, how many of you have been to like Native American like powwows or anything like that? Okay, all right, a few things. Every culture has sacred music. It sounds different, but you can recognize this is holy for them, right? You can recognize it has a particular quality to it that they don't use this at the bar. They don't use this at, uh, you know, other events. They use it for the worship of their gods, right? And so every culture has that. The Catholic Church has its own sacred music, and it is called Gregorian chant. And Gregorian chant, where does it come from? It comes from St. Gregory the Great. That's why we call it Gregorian, because he collected all this stuff. And in fact, the church has a music book. Did you know that? What's the church's music book? Hold it up for me. No, just kidding. You don't have it. You thought it was this. This is not the church's music book, right? We had green ones before. Those were not the church's music book either. This is the church's music book. Ever seen this book before? It's called the Graduale Romanum. Okay, this was a book that was formed after the Second Vatican Council, and it has all the music for every single mass of the year in it. Did you know that? Huh, interesting, right? I didn't know that either. I grew up in a family of musicians. We've been playing at mass my entire life. And I've never even heard of this book until I went to grad school. You know why? Because it's all in Latin. And people didn't like Latin after the council, and they just got rid of it. They said, Beep. not going to use it. We made it for the Mass, and there were people who just simply rejected it. 95% of parishes, 99% of parishes do not use this book, even though this is, in fact, the music of the church. It's because we don't understand what's in it. Now, think about this. Gregory the Great, when did he live? He lived in the 7th century. Okay? And what he was doing is he was trying to gather all the tradition of the music at that point in time into a book for the church. So some of these melodies are as old as the apostles, or even older. In fact, some of these melodies, some of these tunes could have potentially been sung around the time of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came. And in fact, that's why some of these things like, ah, oh, 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 you know, they call it nice. <laughs> Sorry, that's a terrible Gregorian chant. I'm not doing that justice. But the fact is that sometimes you will have, it goes all over the place. You'll have what they call a melisma, where you have one syllable that has like 50 notes. And it's just like going off into the stratosphere, and you're like, I forgot what we're singing. What are we doing? You know, and you're just like wandering about. But the whole point of it was the Holy Spirit carried somebody away because they were caught up in contemplation of the living God. You know what this book is? It's the codification of the gift of tongues in the church. And when we get rid of it, we get rid of the charismatic element of our church and of our faith. If you like charismatic stuff, you'll love this. Ah, that's a challenge, huh? <laughs> a lot of our prayer groups have never heard of this stuff. I grew up in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. I never heard of this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, friends, once we understand it, then we realize that the church has always understood the movement of the Spirit. But just it's a little bit requiring of a sacrifice and time to learn how to do it. So we need people who are trained in this so they can teach us to it again because we've forgotten our traditions. There are actually three things the church gives us right now as valid options for music at Mass. And so if you open your book, you'll recognize when we were going through the readings uh, for today, you've got the entrance antiphon, which we've sang today, right? You've got the offertory antiphon, and you've got the communion antiphon. Those are, in fact, 
musically set. What we have here are simplified versions of things that are in the Graduale Romanum or the Graduale Simplex, translated into English. That's the whole reason why we're trying to do this, is the idea is we shouldn't be singing songs at Mass, we should be singing the Mass. May I say that again? We're not about singing songs at Mass, but singing the Mass, because the Mass is one prayer from beginning to end. And the fact is, is what we've had is we have three options. We have either singing from the Graduale Romanum or the Graduale Simplex, if this is too hard. Simplex, simple, right? You can hear that in the Latin. Even for those who are not initiated, you can hear that, right? So there's another book called the Graduale Simplex that has easier melodies to sing for people who can't sing very well, right? And then you have another collection made by the U.S. bishops, which they never did, so we don't have that option. Or the last one, which is another suitable hymn, which is what 99% of parishes use, which is why we switched to this one, because it has a better selection of hymns, okay? So the fact is all those are appropriate, but recognize that when you're choosing to use a hymn, you're substituting for this. And so musicians, and this is what our choir is trying to do, is either using this as the foundation for picking hymns, or we use stuff from here, right? So we're moving in that direction, and I want people to understand that, that that's not something that is a pre-Vatican II idea. That's something very much consistent with the Second Vatican Council. In fact, the Second Vatican Council has this to say about sacred music. It says, all things being equal, Gregorian chant is to have pride of place in our churches. Have you ever heard that? Hmm. And you know what it also says? It says in the same document that, ev that the Latin is to be retained and every Catholic needs to know the parts of the Mass that pertain to them in Latin. Did you know that? That's what the Second Vatican Council says. So everything I've been doing here in the last five years is a Second Vatican Council thing. I'm not a tratty. I'm a Vatican II priest. Sorry. <laughs> if you don't like it, take it up with the church, right? Because <laughs> the fact is, when we read the documents of the church, we recognize a lot of the things we got after the council were purely made up. I don't know why they made it up or why they ignored the documents, but I'm not going to do that. And neither is our bishop. Our bishop is totally on board with this stuff. That's why he wrote these documents. So I encourage all of us. I could talk for hours on sacred music, but I can't because um, I'm exhausted. And so uh, you probably are too. But in any case, what I, what I want to just... Uh, say is that I'm not ragging on contemporary music. You know why? Because, <laughs> uh, let me just give you a little story. Okay, so remember how I said I grew up with just contemporary praise music in the home? Okay, um, I was a retreat junkie and I went on tons of youth retreats and that was where in fact I found my priestly vocation. I heard the Lord speak to me during a time of Eucharistic adoration and contemporary praise and worship music. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is the mass is one thing but our devotional life is another. All that stuff, that other music, that Jesus music, right, that may not be quote-unquote sacred music for Mass is totally great. And I use it everywhere. It's why we have healing nights here. It's why we have praise and worship and Eucharistic adoration. I'm fully in support of those things because we need both the contemplative aspect of sacred music and we also need the affective dimension that stirs up within us love for Jesus. We need both of them in our spiritual diet. If you only come to Mass on Sunday, you're going to be impoverished. You're not going to be a saint if all you do for your spiritual life is come to Mass on Sunday for an hour. You need to pray every single day and have deep, intimate love for Jesus every day. I want to, I want to share also that the fact is that the church says that pipe organ is the principal uh, if you want to say instrument of the mask, it's the closest to the human voice. The human voice is primary. We need to sing. We can't hide behind our instruments. And that's what happens sometimes is that people use their instruments as a shield to not sing. That's not okay. We have to recognize there's been a huge debate in the church about whether we should have instruments at all. <laughs> right? And we go back and forth between those two ideas. But the fact is, is that I'm okay with other instruments too, as long as they can be rendered fit for sacred worship. I'll give you show and tell. You like show and tell? Okay, you like show and tell. All right, you can record this because this is never going to happen again. Okay. <clears throat> I do not like priests who wear guitars at mass and play it's showboaty and bad, and so I'm really breaking my own rule. I don't like it. So the only reason I'm doing this is to show an example because it's easier to demonstrate it than to talk about it, okay? It's like trying to describe color to a blind person, okay? It doesn't work. All right, music, talking about it is just totally boring and ridiculous. Okay, uh, what happened? Okay, so there's a difference between, remember those three qualities of sacred music, right? You can have something that has the right text, the right music, but the wrong execution, okay? So I'll give you an example, Tanta Marigo, right? What we do for, for adoration, okay? So this is a guitar, right? A guitar can be played several different ways, right? You can play it like this. 
Tantum ergo sacramentum venere morger dewey. Right? And you're like, wow, that's horrible. Um, but also kind of cool. Anyway, no, no. You see, the fact is what it, that does when you use the guitar as a rhythm instrument, it stirs up within you the lower passions. It excites you. That's not the purpose. That's not the point. Contrast that with, say, maybe something like this. Down in adoration follow this great sacrament we hail. Over ancient forms departing, newer rites of grace prevail. Faith for all defects applying, where the feeble senses fail. So you see, if the guitar is supporting the voice as a harp, it can very much be used as a liturgical instrument. Do you see the difference? Lots of instruments are like that. There's a few that can't be used. The rock drum kit is not appropriate for mass because it's only used for concerts. It's a secular thing. It didn't come from, you don't have any cultures that use rock drum kits except Protestants, right? That's not a culture, okay? So if you have drums, they need to be what would be tribal kind of things that's really culturally that, and we're, we don't have that culture here, right? So, so it's just what we do use needs to be appropriate for mass and can be rendered appropriate. Make sense? Okay. Hope that helps. Uh, I want people to know that, that I, I have a really broad musical taste, and it's not about our tastes. Because for me, right, I went to Steubenville, I had masses that were guitar masses and full bands and everything for two years, it was awesome, I loved it. But the fact is, once I started studying the church's document on music, I recognized the church is calling us to something even deeper that is mysterious and I don't quite understand it. But again, heaven is gonna be nothing like this. And so if our experience of mass is a little bit confusing or mysterious and you don't quite get it, that's the point. It's meant to draw you out of your regular experience and say, I've never heard anything like that before. Yeah, heaven is gonna be pretty amazing. So uh, I'll leave it there. Um, there's lots of great uh, resources for sacred music and hopefully we'll talk about that more in the future, but I hope that was helpful.